welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 181, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Joel Billings. Now, Joel is the founder of SSI, that's Strategic Simulations Incorporated, one of the most important uh, game publishers ever, especially if you're interested in strategy games and role-playing games like <laughs> I assume all of you are. We've got a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Joel Billings. Hi hey folks, I am here with Joel Billings. He's the president and co-founder of 2x3 Games with Keith Brewers and Gary Grigsby. Names you're probably familiar with if you're a fan of uh, SSI, uh, which uh, Joel is the founder of. He's also a lifelong war gamer. He's, uh, him and his, he and his company are responsible for many of the best and most complex uh, war games ever made for home computers. He also developed uh, or published some of the best CRPGs ever made, including, of course, the Gold Box uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons series and uh, the Westwood's uh, Black Box series. How are you doing today, Joel? Fine. Fine, Matt. Now, in 2000, you started 2x3 Games to, quote, uh, produce highly detailed war games that are fun, that are also fun to play. Uh, there's a big emphasis there, I notice, on the real research and uh, real history, a lot of historical research. Can you tell me about some of these games uh, that you've been working on? Uh, sure. The, the latest one was War in the East, and now we're working on War in the West, which are World War II uh, uh, Europe theater games. Uh, they're monster games. They follow in the line of War in the Pacific, which got released back about 2004. I mean, really... Uh, sort of over-the-top monster games. They, they, they start from where the old board games I played in high school, like the original SPI War in the East, uh, it starts from there and then it just, it, it expands tremendously because of the computer. I mean, War in the Pacific is crazy when you think about it. Every ship that's in the Pacific down to LSTs and tankers is in there. And, and, and I think there's a database of 10 or 20,000 pilots. So every pilot that fought in the Pacific is in there by name. And wow. it's, it's, now we don't have every historical name, of course. So only about a hundred or two hundred of the pilots are real people with real names based on the the real aces. But uh, there's a name for every pilot, so you can track different people. And and uh, I mean that to me, that's just incredible that the computers can do that kind of detail and pull it off. But it works. And that's uh, you know Gary, my uh, partner, one of the partners on Two by Three, is known for his incredible detail. And uh, that's what we decided to go for. And that's really what we're focusing now with this War in Europe series. Did I hear you use uh, the word monster to describe these games? Yeah. <laughs> Why that? What's so monstrous about it? Uh, well, it started back in the 70s. I think they started calling these board games monster games because they, they were, instead of one board, they were, you know, you take four different boards and put them together. So war in, war in the East, war in Europe, uh, uh, during Nakosta and those games, uh, they were monstrous because they were just huge. You needed a ping pong table literally to set up the game and, and play it. And they had thousands of pieces. And so, and I did that. I, I was in my uncle's garage and the ping pong table with war in the original war in the East board game set up playing with teams of people. I wanted to talk about your childhood. I've looked at some of the other interviews and biographies uh, about you. And it's my understanding you were raised in a very uh, military family, a lot of uh, veterans, including uh, your father, who was an, an artillery field officer, and uh, several uncles. So I'm just wondering, uh, I guess you were obviously very inspired by the stories they told. Yeah, uh, yeah, I got started really early. My father, when I was, uh, was seven, he got a copy of Tactics 2 from his brother, who was a lifer in the army and had landed on D-Day. And uh, they, uh, so he taught me how to play that, that game when I was seven. And uh, the other thing I remember was bedtime reading was Bruce Catton's Civil War books. So he would read Civil War, I remember reading read me Bruce Catton. So he got me really interested in military history from the get-go. And, uh, uh, that that just spurred me on, and so I was playing these games when I was seven, eight, nine, and and reading military history books, and that's just you know my my interest in military history just took off from there. So uh, and having the you know the family connection with history, I mean I, I got lucky enough to go back to the 40th anniversary of D-Day with my father and my uncle, and 
and then the 50th anniversary with my father and that was a lot of fun so uh we used to go to civil war battlefields every time we went back to the east coast so that it just went from there so you know by the time i was 10 or 11 and playing panzer blitz i passed my father and he he had sort of given up on war games but i just kept going were you ever did you have you ever served in the military yourself no not at all and my father who was in the military in world war ii and my uncle, uh, several uncles, uh, you know, my father didn't want to have anything to do with the military. So you have to realize he and my uh, uncle, who was uh, was in the army until the late 60s, early 70s from, you know, were very different people. So I had a connection to the military, but my father was anything but. I mean, he was an English professor who was out uh, protesting the Vietnam War uh, and when my uncle was in Vietnam, so serving you know, during the Tet Offensive. So, you know, it was kind of a conflicted uh, uh, military family. I need to see where I, so your father is actually was not in the military at all. So I, we need to find no, the source. Was, uh, oh, your father was. Yeah my, yeah, my father was. He was in the military. He was the artillery observer in World War II and uh, basically served from D-Day through to the end of the war. And, uh, uh, but he got out of the military as quickly as he could. And yeah, he was a forward observer, uh, first lieutenant, 90 day wonder. <laughs> well, you know, you said you started uh, war gaming at the age of seven, you know, which seems really young uh, to be interested in war games. I kind of like to know a little bit more about uh, those times. Also saw somewhere that you were a fan of the Stratomatic uh, games. Remember that? Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. I, I always thought that was uh, a precursor to Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons and, um, you know, sort of love of statistics and applying a statistical analysis to a, a game. Uh, so I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit about this time of your life when you're playing all these games. What drew you to them? Uh, why, why did you like the math? Well, yeah, the, the math, I mean, I was, a, that, that was, uh, math was always something I was good at. And in fact, I was a math minor in college. So uh, the, the mathematics were interesting. I loved the, the, the numbers. Uh, like I said, the history, uh, we started playing Tactics 2, which was a generic game, but immediately went to Gettysburg and Battle of the Bulge, which my father was at, you know, Battle of the Bulge. That was one we used to play a lot. So you have the history. I I'm just fascinated with the military history. I love that. Uh, and the, the mathematical modeling was, you know, fun, although I wouldn't know what that was when I was seven or eight or nine or ten. But uh, just, you know, I, I got into, into it. And I'd say, you know, by eighth grade, I remember... Uh, I had friends who were in a chess club, and I played chess a little bit, not very much, and they got me to join the chess club, and I, can, I then created a war game club and got all the chess members to play war games. So we were more spending more time playing war games than chess. So, uh, you know, there was that. Uh, Stratomatic came along about the same time. I was really interested in, in uh, statistics, baseball, football, and uh, so in about seventh grade or sixth grade I got Stratomatic football and baseball I remember I solitaired out like the entire 1969 season of football uh, I, I, I didn't get to the last like 20 games I think I had to, I don't remember how many hundreds of games I had to play but you know I kept statistics on all the teams and you know it's just incredible amount of time of course now everybody's you know kids play use computers back then there were no computers so we had to do it all manually so that's that's what I was doing was playing a lot of Stratomatic. I'm wondering then, how did you get into computers? Basically, uh, in college, uh, the first experience I had with a computer was uh, a sophomore in college in 1976. What college was it? If you... uh, Claremont McKenna College in uh, the LA area, and I uh, I was an econ major with a math minor, and I was I had to. I had to switch classes into a semester, and, I, and the only class I could get into was a basic computing class. And so I had to, it was like six weeks into the semester, I switched into it, had to make up six weeks, which was, you know, over a weekend. And, uh, and that, that was my first experience. And we were using Deck 10s, and I think it was. And I, my uh, project for that class was a very, very simple war game. It was one tank and a little grid and... And, uh, you know, the tank had to make a few decisions about moving or shooting. And that was that was my basic program that I wrote. 
And then I uh, was using 360 punch with punch cards for my economics work that I was doing. And so that was, you know, I, I planned on going on to graduate school in economics. And the first experience I had with a personal computer was literally in, uh, I think, May of 79, when I, uh, right before I graduated, I went to a Radio Shack store. Somebody had said, hey, there's this neat, neat computer, you know, the Turis 80. And so I went in and I saw this personal computer. So uh, and that was like in May. And then uh, over the summer, I had a summer job. I was supposed to go to college for graduate school, uh, business school in uh, Chicago. And uh, I just I ended up it just flukes. And I ended up meeting a programmer who was interested in gaming. And we started talking about, well, oh, wouldn't it be neat to put computer you know, war games on computers? And then it just kind of went from there. Do you still have the code to this game that you programmed on the deck? You know, I I did, and I ended up giving it to a museum recently. Uh, really? Yeah, and I'm trying to remember. I, I don't remember the name, but it's, it's a museum in New York of, of gaming and, and toys, and they have a computer area, and I gave them most of my papers and documents that I've had accumulated over the years, and I think I gave them the that game, <laughs> the source code, <laughs> very simple. Yeah, and my, my programming never went beyond basic. I did one game myself for SSI, and that was The Pursuit of the Grass Bay, one of our worst selling games ever, but it was, <laughs> it was the sequel to Computer Bismarck, which is how I was able to pull it off because I was using a lot of the code already written. But I never went beyond basic. Well, let's talk about 1979 uh, when you've According to my records, anyway, you, you found this company, SSI Strategic Stim uh, <laughs> Strategic Simulations Incorporated, uh, with only a thousand dollars. You know, I think that's just, I think I got this from the Wikipedia page. Or, uh -huh. I'm kind of wondering if that's true. So I was thinking, even if you adjust the thousand dollars for inflation, I mean, that's still not a lot of money. You know, yeah. to start a software company. So I'm wondering what what happened uh, to make you want to uh, start this company, and and what were your initial thoughts behind it? Uh, it basically, like I said, it was I, I ran into a, a, somebody who was a programmer and so I'd always thought, yeah, computer you know, war games would be great fun. So I, and I had this summer uh, to play with, so basically it started in July and I, 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 I thought, oh, let's see what we can do. And I, I put out questionnaires in local game stores and there were lo local hobby stores and I was in Silicon Valley. And so, you know, with Apple just starting, so I was in the perfect place. If I'd been anywhere else in the country, SSI probably would have never started. But by, I put those questionnaires in there and I found a, a programmer because the first guys I talked to had work, worked at IBM and they didn't want to give up their IBM jobs for this risky, you know, doing a war game. So I found uh, somebody who was really a war gamer and, you know, had shared the same idea. It'd be great to put it on a computer. So we started working on a game, and, and Com Computer Bismarck was that first game. And, uh, and then uh, Ed Will that was John Lyon was the programmer, and Ed Williger was another programmer I found from these questionnaires where I said, you know, if you're a programmer and interested, contact me. And, and he ended up doing Computer Ambush, which was the second game that we published. So anyway, in about two months, we, by the end of the summer, we got to a prototype stage where we had something working on a North Star Horizon computer because we didn't have an Apple at that point. And this was, I was had a summer job at Amdahl, which is a mainframe computer company. And they had a homebrew computing club. And luckily the, the owner had this North Star Horizon and said, well, you sure you could borrow it in the evenings. And so John programmed up the game. And Basically, it got to a point where it looked like, yeah, we could actually do a game maybe in three or four months. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I put off business school for a year and see how this works? And so that's that's what we did. And in the meantime, uh, I think I was living uh, in my uncle's house at that point, and he was a businessman. He he was uh, in business and really helped a lot in, in pointing me certain places. One of the places he pointed me to was a venture capitalist who introduced me to Trip Hawkins, who was working at Apple at the time. And Trip was came in and said, you know, with his Apple II and basically said, you know, you really should be making this game for the Apple II. Because at that point I didn't even know what Apple was. I thought of the TRS eighty was the 
you know, computer. I was out there. So he convinced me that the Apple with its color graphics, amazing color graphics, would be the best place for a war game, for any game. And so in October, we actually went out and bought an Apple computer. And as far as the money goes, yes, the, the, originally the, the company was started with $1,000. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, we funded with $1,000. But by December, I think we raised uh, about $40,000. And that was all through family and employees and family of employees and, you know, uh, my grandmother's money, you know, that my mother, my uncle and my mother had inherited. So that, that money was the seed money. So it was not just a thousand, it was about 40,000 that ultimately ended up, you know, going into the company. So, and it, and, uh, the amazing thing was we actually were able to finish computer Bismarck by January. So we went start to finish on that game. It was pretty much August when we started, early August, and finished by the end of January. So, and uh, that was pretty amazing, you know, but things were much simpler back then. <laughs> the programs were much simpler. Well, let's talk a bit about uh, Computer Bismarck, uh, 1979. It's reading the, the box, uh, the back of the box, and it says, a simulation of the historical events of May 1941. There's apparently sold over 7,000 copies, which back then was, you know, quite impressive or reasonable. I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit about the game itself. Hmm. Well, the, the big feature of it, uh, the reason why we picked it was uh, we knew that doing artificial intelligence would be important because the whole idea of everybody would expect, oh, you have a computer. Well, you want to play against the computer. That's the big advantage of having a computer. And the other advantage is uh, uh, fog of war. You, you, you don't need a judge to have a, a blind game where you don't know where things are. So we're thinking about, you know, what, what would be a good situation where we could do a game where fog of war was important and uh, AI would be really easy to do. And we thought of the Bismarck situation because, let's face it, there's not a lot of choices the Bismarck has. You know, you only have a couple of ships and you're deciding how to run away from the British Navy. And uh, the fog of war is really important. The whole idea is to find the Bismarck. Once you find it, you know, if you find it, you're likely to kill it. So, so that was the perfect choice for the game uh, situation. So that's why we, we picked it. And, uh, and then it was, uh, you know, that, that was, that was it. And the main thing was, and I'm trying to think, I think we only had the AI playing the German side. You know, it was just too much to have it try to play the British, if I remember right. So that was really early on. That was really the big consideration was, you know, what what subject can you pick where you could create an artificial intelligence? Because we were right in the beginnings of figuring out how to do that. They had to be very simple. Wikipedia page for the game calls it the, uh, quote, first serious war game and the one that legitimized uh, the market for computer war games. Mm -hmm. Just wondering uh, what else was out at the time, and, and do you agree that this was the, really the first serious war game? Yeah, we, we beat Avalon Hill by about six months uh, to the market with a computer war game, and, and I, don't, yeah, I don't know of anything else. There, there wasn't much in the way of serious games, period. I mean, when our game came into the stores in late January of 1980, uh, it was boxed, like you said, and the the other games were in Ziploc bags. I mean, they they were mostly arcade games that had been you know simple you know Space Invader type you know games, and sold in Ziploc bags. So there really wasn't any anything out there at the time. It was really new. I mean, there are a couple of things to show you how small the market was. Uh, Trip got us access to the Apple II warranty list in January. So uh, we could do a mailer to all of those people. And there were 30,000 people on the warranty list. That was it. So, the, you, know, you know, not everybody registers, but most people register a $2,000 purchase at that time. That was a pretty big purchase. So, you know, 30,000 people, that's it. That's the entire marketplace. So it's not very big. Uh, the other thing was, uh, uh, the, the, I think one of the biggest phone calls that happened in SSI history was in August when we had just started and you know we thought okay we can do this we can make a game and i, and I thought well how are we going to sell this game and i wasn't thinking about being a, a, a publisher so i called avalon hill because they were my heroes you know since i was a kid i've been playing avalon hill games and i i called them up and i ended up getting tom shaw and talking to him and i told him what we were doing you know we had a game and you know we were thinking about uh 
finding somebody to publish it perhaps. And he said, oh, they were already working on a bunch of computer games and basically blew me off. And uh, which I guess not surprising since here I was, I was just out of college, what do I know? And uh, he, he didn't take it seriously, I guess. And at that point, so we ended up you know, going forward and I thought, okay, we're gonna have to publish this ourselves. So I had to learn how to do that. And uh, they came out with their first games. I think they released six different games uh, in June at uh, the big Origins game show every year that happened. So they, they were about five months behind us. So I'd say they were the next group of you know, people actually putting out war games. But their games were actually really simple compared to Computer Bismarck. Computer Bismarck was more like what people would see in a board game and their games were, you know, a lot simpler. So, but that's like they missed a great opportunity. Yeah, they really did. So I think the lesson there is, you know, don't blow off people, you know, <laughs> until you look, take a look into it, you know, there might be something there. So, uh, uh, and I, I think I learned that lesson because Gary, you know, came along in 1981 and the, the, and he became our most prolific author. He, he published uh, or designed 25 games that SSI published over the years. And I met him because he called, uh, he had bought our Torpedo Fire game in, in 1981. He called with a technical support question. At that time, I was the technical support hotline for SSI. And so I think we had maybe eight employees or something total. And uh, I, I got him on the phone and we, you know, I answered his questions and then he started talking about he had a computer and he was kind of fooling around programming a game. And so I said, oh, great. You know, and we talked about what it was. It was his Guadalcanal campaign. And I said, well, you know, when you get it to a point where you're interested, you know, you think it's playable, you know, send it. So he did. We sent it in and we started publishing his games. So, you know, you know. You mean this, this guy got a job by calling up a tech support hotline? Yeah. <laughs> and he literally he was a he worked for the government i think he he was it was a defense contractor and he was doing some kind of an accounting or oversight or something for a defense contractor and you know so he would he programmed this game at night and uh when he sent it in he didn't quit right away after the first one he did a couple of games he did that and he did uh bomb alley i think north atlantic 86 so he programmed a few games and then he quit his job once the royalties were started coming in. But I mean, he was, he was very happy to, to switch to programming games for a living. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a, uh, either we'll continue the Joel Billings uh, interview or I might have an update for you from Mr. Chris Taylor. His uh, company, Gas Powered Games, has launched a new Kickstarter for a game called Wild Man, an evolutionary RPG slash RTS game. Looks fantastic and Chris has agreed to come on and tell us about it, so hopefully I'll have that for you next week, but uh, we'll definitely continue with uh, Mr. Billings either next week or the week after, so don't fret. As always, I want to thank you very much if you have supported this show. It's really important, guys. If you want to keep these episodes and interviews coming, please go to armchairarcade.com. Look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner of the page. Set up a subscription or just make a one-time donation. Either way, it helps me to keep making these shows, and I appreciate it very, very, very much. So thank you, guys. Now what about that ale of the week? This week I've got another ale here from Mr. Herbert Gilliland. Uh, thank you very much, Herbert, for sending me this Anarchist Alchemist. This is another ale from the BrewDog Company. It's at 14% alcohol. Gotta love that. Uh, Triple India Pale Ale. Now, like the other BrewDogs, it's got you know a really great write-up here on the bottle, so I thought I would read it to you. This one's uh, rather fun. F the system. And they actually wrote out the, the, the word uh, there, which I can't believe they put that on the bottle, but anyway, F the system, forget what you know, what has been, bow to no one, history is bereft, reorder, disorder, embrace the unknown, the groundbreaking, the challenging, the Icarus revolution is upon us, anarchist alchemist, try until your fingers bleed and your mind is numb, try harder, try this, try that. Try the other. Try what hasn't been tried, then try again. Keep trying. 
Forget the new, the Molten Elixir Awakens. Now that, my friends, is some uh, bottle text. <laughs> I feel like I'm already a little lightheaded just from reading that. So let's get this open and see what the Anarchist Alchemist is all about. Okay, so I'm here with the rather excellent drinking horn filled with Anarchist Alchemist. I've been smelling this. And it smells uh, quite nice, actually. You can smell the hops in here. It smells very fresh, very uh, fragrant. Actually, very pleasant aroma. It's not overpowering. 14% uh, alcohol, you definitely don't smell it. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. Uh, here's Steve Herbert. <sighs> hmm. Now, that is an interesting taste. Uh, kind of the hops, the bitterness, the sort of a chocolatey flavor there. Um, not really, it doesn't have that alcohol kick, which is really surprising uh, given that 14%. I expected to really taste uh, alcohol strongly. Uh, miraculously, I do not. <laughs> I don't know how they managed to pull that off. There must truly be some alchemists there at BrewDog. Uh, it's actually quite a sophisticated flavor. When it, when it first hits your... Uh, your mouth, you sort of taste the uh, the chocolatey flavor and the and the hops, uh, but then later you start to get some sort of cherry flavors. Uh, it's a, actually kind of a, a sophisticated experience here. It's uh, you know I don't know if I've ever had anything quite like this before. I mean, alchemist, anarchy, and alchemy are definitely the right words to describe this. It's sort of like my palate doesn't quite know what to how to register these uh, flavors. Uh, but anyway, very, very nice, actually. Uh, it's just the right amount of bitterness. Uh, it tastes, uh, the hops is, is really nice. Got sort of chocolates and cherries and maybe some, uh, uh, some coffee flavors there. Uh, just a really, really good uh, selection there. I haven't had one this good in a long time, so I'm going to go for a full five out of five on this one. Uh, Anarchy, Anarchist Alchemist. Really amazing uh, selection here. So thank you very much, Herb. <laughs> uh, rare that I get to try something I enjoy this much. All right, what about that quotation? Uh, the quotation for this week, I thought uh, I'd pull something from the military history file. And so I looked up uh, George Patton, and uh, the quotation I found goes something like this. No bastard ever won a war dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. See you guys next week. I want a prayer, a weather prayer. Well, I don't know how this is going to be received, General. Praying for good weather so we can kill our fellow man. Well, I can assure you, sir, because of my intimate relations with the Almighty, if you write a good prayer, we'll have good weather.